Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, hopefully you are you are being able to see the slides. If not, please uh, write it in the comment. Uh, so we are also uh, we are also the Sol System Simulia partner. We work with their different solutions, including uh, simulation solutions such as Abacus, iSight, AppSafe, and Tosca. iSight, uh, AppSafe, and Tosca. It, it uh, iSight helps with uh, uh, doing optimization and reliability study and also workflow automation. AppSafe is primarily for metal fatigue. And it also has other modules which can look into non-metals uh, and also weld fatigue. Uh, Tosca is a non-linear optimizer. Uh, Katia is more on the CAD and also it can have some analysis capability. Delmia is process uh, and manufacturing automation. Uh, we provide both consultancy automation and customization services and also we provide training, so which is an integral part of our offering. And, uh, and on the software side, we are Dissolve System uh, Simulia reseller. So if you have any software needs, uh, not only just Simulia, but also Ketia, Delmia, 3D Experience, all the portfolios for the Dissolve System, we do provide those software services. On uh, technical capabilities, one of the uh, main areas of our um, of our expertise is uh, we do a lot of component design. So design by analysis validation, simulation, fatigue and fracture mechanics, we do crack population modeling, and also we provide multi-physics simulation capabilities because the thermal and structural, uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, composite, uh, composite structures is also something we delve into quite a bit. Uh, we do a lot of structural analysis, uh, like uh, as, plan as part of the plant engineering, and uh, FEA model validation testing. Uh, specifically for fitness for service and design by analysis capability, we uh, this slide shows our capability around around the uh, uh, around the uh, fracture mechanics evaluation. So we do both code based fracture mechanics evaluation as well as uh, all the FEA based modeling. We also do damage mechanics modeling. We have material testing support and uh, also. Uh, probabilistic fracture mechanics or in general like any problem if you are looking into a, a probabilistic sense then we can we have the capability to do that uh, it can be also like a uh, benefit over uh, doing uh, remediation and having an uh, having a flaw that leads to an accident so what is the economic impact of that we can do that in simulation in probabilistic sense as well on our CFD capabilities uh, we have uh, we have pretty much all all the avenues covered on the CFD uh, so combustion, fluid structure interaction, any vibration or pulsation problem, heat uh, transfer, blast and explosion, erosion, corrosion, and also capturing the chemical reaction. Our operational support. So we we do provide operational support uh, in, through our partners. Uh, so uh, we do uh, remaining life assessment level one and two analysis, root cause assessment, in environment uh, testing and integrity management and risk assessment and also plan maintenance and operation so if you have any if you have any query let us know we'll reach out to our partner and provide you more details on those services uh, for testing and uh, and our failure analysis we do a lot of fractographic testing and a lot of in-service material uh, testing and also failure assessment because uh, for failure assessment one has to look into the, the material environment, environment and the load so we we can uh, bring all those aspects in our analysis and provide the assessment for the failure. Uh, we uh, have a uh, we have a uh, quite a big list of courses that we offer. Uh, they can be industry related as well as simulia because related courses. So we do offer the API five seven nine courses, and we are also coming up with the ASME design by analysis course. Uh, these are more geared towards the using FEA for solving your problem, which is level three now. So introducing uh, FFS. So this is kind of an interactive triangle uh, that shows that for 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 a uh, damage mechanism to occur, you have to have the uh, material uh, material properties that will probably lead into certain damage mechanism, the environment, uh, the flow assurance part of it, and also the loading part of it. So if 
if all the all the triangle this triangle is there then there is a possibility that something may go wrong so if then we can look into whether we need to change the material or maybe the operating condition or the loading by changing the design or modifying the existing design so uh, in fitness for service always uh, we look at the problem as uh, from all the aspects not not just the loading or or just the material corrosion aspect of it so FFS is the ability to demonstrate the structural integrity for an in-service component containing a flaw or damage. It can be a crack-like flaw or not crack-like flaw. It provides a quantitative engineering analysis and address the imperfection and equipment fabrication or in-service degradation. And it helps make informed decision based, based on physics-based analysis, numerical techniques, uh, and also looking into all the mechanisms that is going on. So it's a multidisciplinary approach uh, that one can have for a fitness for service. There are key references that are being used. Uh, so uh, I've listed some of them. So API 579, BS 7910, ASME section 11, B31.3, section 2, and section 8 as well. So now talking about the levels of assessment. So we will we'll mostly, for our current presentation, we are mostly focusing on level 3 assessment. So Level 3 assessment procedure includes uh, intended to provide more detailed evaluation, which is, of course, if you, go, you have to go beyond the level 2 requirement. And then it's, it's a lot of information you need to do a level 3 uh, assessment. And also the, uh, the analysis itself becomes complex. But with that, you are capturing more and more physics, more and more unknowns are now known because you have more information about the equipment, loading condition, uh, material, uh, all the design aspects and service conditions. So it, it gives you it gives you a better idea of what what can go wrong or how is the equipment is operable in the future. Uh, it generally requires specialist fitness for service engineers, uh, and so we we do provide uh, that we have that background both from the software side as well as the code and industry application side. Now generally there are uh, four failure modes that uh, one will look into, which is plastic collapse, which is more of a global collapse, and then local failure, collapse from buckling, and failure on the cyclic load. So we uh, follow the API 579 guidelines for those analysis. These are some of the examples uh, for level three assessment. So in the first one, we are looking into your bus, bus load assessment with the pipe with ID flow. So there, there is a, uh, a lot, loss of thickness uh, and, and uh, in in the ID and uh, with that we uh, we bring that uh, loss of thickness in in our FEM model and with the existing loads and boundary condition we analyze whether it satisfies the criteria mentioned in the previous slide. So then we can also do limit load analysis or buckling analysis. These are I mean some of the structures are vessels, so I just have some pictures for that, but it can be applicable. In general. Uh, more on that. So, if you have a more of a crack-like flaw, we can do a fracture mechanics space assessment. So, there are two kinds of assessment we can do. One is actually model, modeling the flaw itself in the in in, in the FEA, uh, so that we get the cracked intensity parameters and using that uh, with the material-based uh, pro properties, stress intensity, fat material, uh, K1C, and all. Uh, or what we can do is we can model the geometry in details and get the stress distribution or at the location of the crack and if the crack is of standard um, shape and then we can use uh, standard formulas in that uh, so the instead of doing FEA we can more use like closed form solutions that are available uh, in uh, many references and then look at the crack intensity parameter from the stresses that we evaluate from the FEA. We can also do probabilistic fracture assessment. Uh, so the basic idea is I'll start with the initial flaw, and these are all done in a probabilistic setting. So then, then there will be a there will be a fracture mechanics based model which will grow the flaw, and then there will be uncertainty in the crack growth parameters. Even the initial flaw will come from a probabilistic distribution. Now there will be a certain detection probability, and if the flaw is detected, then it will be taken out, and and then uh, service will be continued. So in that way, the final probability of failure can be assessed in terms of all these probabilistic parameters. Uh, we uh, also do leak before break assessment, which is basically looking into uh, the leakage through a flaw, uh, so through an opening through the wall. And uh, one of the one of the, as the challenging aspect in that is in presence of residual stress, your crack opening has to be uh, determined properly. So there there are 
guidance and standards available to uh, for that but also you can do a residual stress simulation and look at how how the crack opening will be and based on that you can you can do a thermal hydro uh, you can do a hydraulic model to find out what is the leakage to the crack uh, one of the uh, thing you have to uh, satisfy for leak before weight assessment is there is no active degradation mechanism going on and also the floor is uh, going more in a, uh, in a true thickness manner than circumferential manner. So we can do all those uh, analysis. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the major one of the major tasks for a pipe, pipeline uh, um, pipeline structure is because they are joined through welds. So uh, welding process simulation can become very important uh, to look into the integrity of your pipeline. So uh, I have some slides which talks uh, in details about the welding process simulation capability. We, we use Abacus for that, so there is also a plugin available uh, to do this, and you can always modify the plugin to your need. Uh, it uses realistic thermal boundary condition to solve for accurate temperature profile within the weld and simulate the welding process and residual stress used using a thermomechanical model. Uh, so the plugin that's available is Abacus Welding Interface. So you can define your geometry or you can define your weld path, the bead size, and also the welding parameters, and it will do the thermal simulation. And then the uh, stress is that because of the temperature difference, it will calculate the stresses. So generally, the, there is a I mean, in general, there is a complete workflow available. So you can uh, you can add add the material. Uh, so elements are uh, activated in pro uh, progressively, and then heat input we use the cold act heat model, and then for cooling uh, we consider the film and radiation condition, and for post processing we can look into the deformed shape residual stress and also do the parametric study with the weld parameters and uh, uh, with all the welding parameters and as well as uh, and that includes the bead size uh, and also the um, the speed of the torch and the energy input. And all. <clears throat> so uh, what we will gain out of this is uh, once we do the residual stress simulation, then we can do a uh, failure assessment using the residual stress and using some sort of it can be probabilistic or I mean you can do a full project, uh, probabilistic method or maybe you can do like a and design space simulation where you can look at different scenarios, what if scenarios, uh, to make a more informed decision on, on your welding parameters. Or if you already have a set welding parameters that you have used for your weld, welding process, then we can simulate that and see what, what is the final residual stress that the structure may be subjected to. And using that residual stress field, then we will do further analysis with crack or without crack in the way. These are some of the examples that we have. So uh, on on the left, it is we have pipe to pipe weld simulation. So we it is this is used for uh, this was used for weld weight sensitivity study, and then uh, you, you can have a 360 degree weld simulation showing the temperature distribution. You can look into the hoop stress and also the distortion. Uh, phase transformation uh, because of the phase transformation, the material properties will change. So you all you can look into the uh, phases of uh, phases of the materials like perlite, ferrite, austenite, and bainite. And uh, so, using the weld simulation, you can look into the hardness of your material uh, close to the weld and the heat affected zone. Uh, and, and then from that, you can make decisions on how the material is going to behave in those conditions. Uh, as I briefly mentioned about uh, before, we do provide automation, uh, workflow automation, uh, and also software development services catering to your specific needs. Uh, these are some. Of the, these are available with under so you can you can always download this. It's actually available. So this plugin tool creates automatically two material properties for use with isotropic classicity model, and this is based on the API 579 code recommendation. So you give the uh, the code based material minimum material properties, and it will draw the stress strain curve for it. This is a thickness mapping tool. So if you have scanned data, where generally it's like a spreadsheet form. So it has the breed and the thickness, and you, you can bring it into a, if you, if you make a shell model, you can bring in the map, you can map your major thickness to the shell model where the each element will be assigned the thickness based on the thickness at the breed location. So this process takes a lot of time. So through this plugin, this, this, uh, this again, you can shorten the amount of time or effort you are spending on it. 
for fracture mechanics plugin. So we this is developed for pipeline gut weld simulation, and uh, this takes all that information about the crack, the material property, pipe, uh, the boundary condition, and there are certain controls you can have on the uh, uh, on the mesh. Uh, based on that, it will it will uh, create the model. It will throw, it will put the focus cracked in mesh around the crack. Uh, this is using the conventional method, so then it will submit for analysis and get the practical parameters from the output. And if required, it will compare with the material uh, practical parameters. Now, going into the case studies, uh, I will discuss some of the problems that that relates to what we have discussed before uh, as capabilities. Uh, one of the things I want to mention first, so we do have the optimization capabilities. So using iSight or other softwares, we can help with uh, optimizing your prom op optimizing your objective function uh, for your design. And it it basically creates a workflow with many different uh, application softwares. It can be in-house or a standard commercial software. And then uh, it, uh, iSight has the optimization algorithm as well as, so you can do both deterministic optimization as well as for reliability based optimization. Uh, and any script, anything that you can run from your computer in, using the EXP file. And, and also the, the software has to give you access to the in, to modify the input. So if that can happen, then you can use iSight uh, to run or the, to create the workflow and run an optimization problem. So, so, for this particular example, there was a uh, piping system that was analyzed uh, with uh, with the bound, uh, with the support conditions uh, to minimize uh, minimize the vibration, and it has shown significant cost savings to the customers. So this is an example of a thermal mechanical stress induced in a pipe bending analysis. So we have done a thermal mechanical analysis so where the pipe is being bent and because of the bending simulation, the thickness was non-uniform. So we have captured the thickness because there was certain concerns uh, with that. Uh, so, and, and also for every model we do, uh, we do uh, try to validate if there's a test data or already, uh, already present physical data available. If not, then we do some standard engineering checks from based on solid mechanics principle, if you know, to make sure our model basically makes sense. So validation, this model was validated because they already had some cases where they have the they have made pipe through that process and they can measure the thickness. And using that after that validated, using that validated model, then we run the, what different what if scenarios to see how we can modify the process to, to get a more uniform thickness. This was a case study for heater tube integrity where corrosion was going on and there was a sort of a bulging was forming. So we have we have used uh, we have wrote our uh, own subroutine based on the API five seven nine. So there is a pre subroutine available in the Abacus. We have modified it to suit the requirements for API five seven nine, and then we have done the pre assessment and, and compared our results with the physical method. This is an example where we have done a level three assessment for locally thin area. So at the support conditions, the pipe. The pipeline was getting corroded, but overall, this was I mean, this had it. Uh, I mean, we had to consider a globally the pipeline piping system because of the thermal expansion, uh, the loads we have to capture, uh, the boundary condition even away from the locally thinned area. That's why what we have done is we have made a combined uh, 3D and 2D uh, model. So uh, along the locally thinned area, we have done a full 3D model, but away from that, we have used pipe elements. Uh, 2D pipe elements to model the thermal expansion, uh, and uh, this is one of the ways where we we can use uh, as detailed as as may be needed for our analysis. So we always look at ways how we can uh, how we can not overly complicate the model, but also at the same time uh, bring in enough enough complexity in the model so that we can capture the right uh, behavior that is going on, the right physics that is going on at the area of the interest. This is a case study for uh, dent with rerounding. So these are very generic pictures that I'm showing. So because some of these are actual projects, so we have made some generic files out of that. But it will show you the basic idea of what uh, we are solving in terms of uh, using simulation of real simulation. <clears throat> so we perform the simulation of denting, uh, denting and removal of the constant of the object, and then we there is a rebounding effect, and then the, we measure the uh, equivalent plastic strain to determine if there is a possibility of cracking or not. 
So uh, what we can do is we can look at the size of the, we can look at the uh, shape and size of the passivity zone and it will give you an idea about how big or small it is and whether it can be of concern. So this analysis was done for corroded pipe with an outer dent. Uh, so we basically modeling the geometry within the pipe for the dent. And then we looked into uh, looked into the inter under internal pressure whether this will um, uh, the, the integrity will be maintained or not. Uh, and also pipe with an external dent, the actual denting process was simulated in this one. And, and generally you will have field data available so you can always validate your model with the field data and if not then you have to if the validation is uh, I mean as the data numbers are not matching up then you have to look into the model maybe some of the material properties are not properly known or the condition when, with which the dating happened is not known so you can always parameterize your model and and use that uh, to match the match the actual physical data and then with that validated model, you can go ahead and do the water scenarios. So this is an example of a um, material gouging with uh, which becomes like local local metal loss. So again, this is more about putting the geometry uh, into into the model. And as you can see, the mesh uh, close to the uh, gouge area is is very fine because this is our area of interest. So we need to capture the stresses and strains properly in that location. And then based on once once we have that in the model, then we'll run with the loading and check for plastic collapse and local failure. This was a gouge interaction study because the concern was whether the gouges are close enough so that they are if they are interacting or not. So we wanted to see if the stress stress regions are overlapping and sort of done a parametric study of how how close they can be without overlapping stresses on each other, so that we can combine some of the uh, gouges. Uh, so this one, uh, what we what we have done is uh, based on this analysis, we were able to provide the client with information about how whether they will need to combine two gouges which are close enough. So we have given them a qualitative criteria for that. Uh, this is an example of an axial flaw in a pipe. So basically, you have to put the crack tip there and, and have the focus mesh, and then run the model with the applied loads and boundary condition to get the crack tip intensity parameters and compare with the material fracture toughness. So there's uh, more more information on the same model. Uh, this was a pitting corrosion study, so where a few assessment for pitting corrosion was made. So we considered the pit both as flaw and also as a stress concentrate, uh, concentrator. So and now we looked at both ellipsoidal pit and spherical pit. And using the stress concentration factor, so we did a flaw me a fracture mechanics based evaluation, considering pit as as a flaw, and also we have done a, a and we took the stress concentration factor and then we have done a strength check based on the stress concentration factor. This is uh, this was uh, done for an indentation or forming analysis where. Um, because of the indentation, it was a uh, it it was a cold temperature scenario. Whether the concern was that the crack or the crack tip intensity parameter will be close to the material uh, uh, fracture toughness. So what we have done is we have done the indentation process, get the area of the plastic the plastic zone, and then based on the plastic zone, these are all non-standard crack shape. So this, if you can see in the pictures here, they they are not elliptical or, uh, or they are not elliptical flaw. So we have actually taken the area that's coming out of the uh, plasticity zone and used that as a flaw in the model and model it using attractive focused element. And then we got the stress intensity back. And this was done with and without the residual stresses to see the effect of residual stresses on the fracture properties. Yeah. Uh, this was for example for a pipe lamination. So we use the seam where basically you can define a surface as seam, then out, then the yes, FEA software creates two nodes at the same geometry point and under tensile load the two nodes can suffer. So we have done some lamination problem using that. This is an example for a earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe design. So where we have uh, there, there was data available. There was data available for a small diameter pipe, whereas a large diameter pipe, there was no test data available. So we have validated our model for the small diameter pipe uh, using FEA and compared it with the test data. Once the model is, uh, once the model on the workflow is validated, then we use the similar approach.
for the large diameter pipe and come up with the spring stiffnesses for for the joint. So we have equivalent joint stiffness values from the FEA, and then we have done a 2D pipe element model to analyze and using those joint stiffnesses, we have analyzed it uh, to see how the pipeline will behave if it is at a fault location. These are some of the examples uh, where uh, we um, we looked into pipe soil interaction. As with your pipeline, there is always uh, there can be debris flows or mudslide, and also this, these are high large deformation problems. So we have used a uh, coupled orally and Lagrangian formulation uh, to look at the uh, impact on the pipeline from the debris flow. Uh, so. Um, now another possibility will be if you are at a cold temperature zone, there can be thaw settlement and all. So we can simulate the thermal and mechanical interaction between void pipeline and permafrost, and also predict the differential settlement and pipe deformation from the permafrost thawing and thawing at the soil formation transition. So what we have done is in this model, uh, we bring in the thermal simulation so that we know what what the, how the pipe is deforming and based on the deformation the pipe will generate stresses and strains then we look into that for further evaluation this is uh, an example for a frost tape simulation so pipe strain was evaluated using a pipe soil interaction model so we have we have done we have modeled the pipe soil interaction in terms of equivalent springs and we looked into uh, with the frost tape what's going to be the stresses and strains in the pipe structure Now, uh, most uh, all the previous examples, it, it was more on the either either a solid model, uh, either a structural model or a soil structure interaction. Now we are talking about more of a fluid structure interaction. So these are the case studies from uh, combining FEA and CFD or just doing a CFD simulation. Now this is an example for a multi-phase flow using CFD. Uh, multi-phase. This shows in a jumper, but you can think of it as any. any uh, pipeline uh, with um, bends or, or or a T T connection and all this. So we look into the free surface analysis, internal multi-phase flow, produced turbulence, and direct free structure interaction. And some of the things we look at is the transport efficiency, volume fraction, the pressure fluctuation, and then of course the stresses and strains you are if you are doing a free structure interaction problem. These are examples of pipe flow induction induced motion assessment. So uh, here again, the idea is to that your um, your fluid motion is uh, your fluid parameter. The pressure from your fluid is changing your structure. The uh, your st uh, and then because of your structural geometry is changing, then it also affects the uh, affect affect the fluid flow. So this has been done using a, a interaction model. And some of the things we can capture is flow induced turbulence, flow induced pulsation, flow induced vibration, and all. These are corrosion assessment examples where uh, basically one of the one of the major thing about corrosion is about the velocity and the impact angle, so that you look at the moment of transfer and based on that there are uh, formulas available where you can you can relate your uh, relate your impact velocity and all with certain corrosion material data which relates to the corrosion. Now this is a better, uh, this is more of a simulation based way to look into the corrosion because internally there is how corrosion is related to with your fluid flow field. So the idea was to uh, simulate that fluid, fluid flow field and then use use the standard, uh, standards available that relates with your corrosion rate with, with your given fluid flow field. Uh, to find out the final corrosion. So this gives a better insight into the problem that you are looking at. So if you are trying to, the numbers may not be exactly accurate, but you can look at the different parameters, sensitivity or what changes in your design or changes in your operating condition you can make so that you get a desirable result. Uh, so this is again uh, an example for corrosion analysis. So CFD simulation for pipeline flow assisted corrosion due to the effect of carbon dioxide was evaluated in this. And uh, and again, uh, validation is a key for any of these problems. And all, as I have said before, so although you may not get the exact number that you might find in an actual scenario, this gives a very good idea about how, how the parameters, how the effect of changing the parameters are on your problem of interest. So it gives a very good insight into the problem. 
so uh, that uh, pretty much concludes uh, all all my case studies and then i'll open it up for discussion i kind of finished maybe five ten minutes early so we have more time uh, to talk about if you have any question uh, so do let me know i'll open up the session for q a Okay, we are taking questions now and we're already we already have a couple of questions. Okay. What is Yeah, I can read. Okay. That. So the first question is what is probabilistic analysis and how it differs from sensitivity uh, sensitivity and partial safety factor methods? Okay. So in in your probabilistic analysis you your inputs are random. I mean, some of the inputs are random. I guess you can always make an assumption that some are more well defined or well known. Uh, so, using the random input, of course, if your inputs are random, it goes through a sort of a mapping process, right? Whenever you do an analysis, uh, and then you, your outputs are random too. So, in a probabilistic analysis, you you include the input randomness and look at the effect on the output from that randomness. So, your output becomes random. For sensitivity study. Uh, it's basically you, you change you see how, how what is the contribution of a parameter to the problem so it doesn't in, it capture the inherent randomness of a problem but it says okay these are the main parameters so if you have a say a pipe if you want to look at hoop stress so pr by t right so you can see right now that pr and t are the main parameters that will change your hoop stress maybe there is some boundary condition that may not have much effect. Uh, like external remote boundary condition. So sensitivity gives you an idea of what are the important parameters. Now partial phase safety factor is it, it does include some sort of statistical basis in it. So instead of doing a full set of probabilistic analysis, you can use partial safety factor. So we have worked on some examples where there there is a code recommended partial safety factor. But if you if you use that partial safety factor, then things are good. So the idea was to now we'll do the problem looking at the actual randomness or probabilistic setting and then we'll calculate sort of the partial safety factor based on our analysis and we have found that the partial safety factor that's given in the code we can use a lower value of partial safety factor uh, how about post well so i'm going to the next question how about post well heat treatment temperature analysis yes we can we i haven't included any sample for that but we can always do, as I said, we can do thermomechanical problems of post well heat treatment. Temperature analysis can always be done. Yeah, so how to check material property of materials during the post well heat treatment temperatures. So, uh, in, in, in the welding simulation, you have seen that we, are, we can use this phase transformation algorithm. So, you can use the same algorithm for your post well heat treatment temperature analysis, and based on the temperature, it gives gives you the material property so you can look at the hardness and all which of course is not given in, given in the code when okay another question is when there are so many laminations and the different planes and overlapping how do you gather the data for that it is extremely hard to visualize and size all the lamination depending techniques including phase array so uh, from simulation side, what we can do, and code gives you guidance. So if if you if you have any damage, so this is not just true for lamination; it can be for any damage. And the one case we talked about the gouges, whether they are closed or not. So that kind of gives you an idea. So if they are interacting, so what you can do either you model all the interactions, but even as you said correctly, even to get that in with inspection data is extremely difficult. So if you see there are there are things that are closely spaced and if you if you can find out sort of some of the information how far apart they are and uh, code gives a guidance or you can conservatively take things to be like combined together so if you are if you are finding a lot of many laminations then you can combine them as a big lamination and zone and you can put that in the model and
So let me see if there are some more questions. Is Abacus FFS plugin toll free for everyone? How to get the plugin? Okay. Yeah, so the Abacus FFS plugin, so one of the plugins we showed is developed by our uh, by wire. Uh, the other few will, will include some information maybe. So there is, if you go to their uh, knowledge base community, so these are available for free. Uh, so you can download the plugin that has been developed by Abacus uh, free from there. So there, there is no cost to it. Uh, Abacus building simulation, I will double check, but I think right now it's a paid version, but the older version is uh, free to download. Uh, we'll also include that information in our slide. Yes, so I know there are provisions in API 579 to group lamination and consider them as uh, one single point. Yes, and, and I think in any terms of measuring data, if we do not know something, then we have to assume the worst case scenario. So how do you calculate residual stress for in-service equipment? So, I mean, from a simulation-wise, the calculation of residual stress for in-service equipment as long as you are capturing the thermomechanical pro uh, properties, then it will the analysis will show your residual stress. Yes, so element quality check. Uh, you always have to be careful about the element that you are choosing. Um, so al abacus elements they have already been verified to be accurate. So if you will expect the behavior that abacus has. Okay, this element can capture, say, displacements, but not rotation. So those are already been verified. They have element testing done, so they are they do test with their element. But for your application, then you have to uh, you have to make sure that your elements of are of good quality. One of the thing is during validation, this may come up, and also some standard knowledge in doing FEA. So you have to like generally for in the area of interest, we you don't want to use like a triangular fashion or uh, were you able to perform the data smoothing trial and tool to build a model in Abacus? Yes, so we will be able to do that. Uh, how crack like flaw is modeled? So, any crack like flaw, uh, the way to model is you, you will use the feed. So, crack is, is basically in a continuum, there will be two surfaces that, that now can open up. Uh, but at the practice, then I'm just talking about not getting into the details of it. There's a linear elastic fracture mechanics. So linear elastic fracture mechanics uh, uh, assumption is that your stress will go to infinity at the practice. So there is a special element formulation. Uh, basically, you move the mid-side node of the element to quarter point, and then you have to have those elements which will then, then capture this behavior. So uh, one thing you have to do is you have to put a focus mesh. It looks like a spider wave. I, have that example in some one of the problems you can see the mesh has a particular shape around the practice so you model the crack to the scene and then define that crack those crack with mesh and at the practice the elements you have to move the quarter point element you have to move the midpoint to quarter point for that element then you will be able to capture that behavior yeah there's a few more questions coming in Yes, we have a question that asks, how do you deal with emergency situations? If we require a very quick analysis, how short can your turnaround time be? Yeah, uh, we do understand that uh, sometimes you you have to you have to probably get the get an answer or a workable solution right away. And the one one of the ways we do it is, of course, if uh, we quickly get into the meeting and look at your problems and have the discussion with your team. And then we go in steps. So we sharpen the pencil as is needed. So first we, we, we may quickly uh, do some very simplified problem. And if it passes all the requirements, then you are fine. If not, then we bring in complexity and all. So depending, depending on the, I mean, we, we can, to answer your question, then we can get into your problem immediately. We have, we have done this drill many, many times and we are, we are used to that. We know your urgency. And we, our team is equipped as well as experienced to handle that situation. And generally, what we do in this kind of situation also, we give our give our assessment results in a PowerPoint format so that you can go ahead with your decision making process. But later on, we write a detailed report with uh, explaining everything what we have done and how we have done. So in, we we the reporting is done in a two two step process.
Okay. So a follow-up question to that is, can you articulate on the content of the report? What can a client expect to get? Yeah, so uh, in terms of content of the, on the report, uh, content of the report, we, our reports are pretty detailed. So we put all the assumptions, all the methodology, how we have developed the model and all. And then uh, if you require, we can also uh, give you the input for I mean, all the simulation files and all for your reference. So our report generally have very, very uh, detailed explanation of what we have done, what input we have taken, what are the rationale, uh, rationale against doing certain modeling aspects. Okay, is there anything else? Okay. Okay, how do advocates provide results stress in category as defined in ASM in division two? Okay. So the stress categories, uh, Abacus doesn't, so if you, if you are talking about the stress categories given in the code, uh, so Abacus is a general purpose software, so you, you have to kind of follow the code guidance to understand the stress categories, so primary and secondary stresses and all. Uh, so Abacus in general doesn't, doesn't classify those stresses. And another question is, Yes, can we get this recording? Yes, we'll, we'll share the recording, we'll share the presentation file, and we'll be more than happy to uh, have a discussion after uh, after this to one of our FEA or CFD experts. And if you have any questions, we can discuss offline as well. Uh, what allowable stress do you consider while analyzing equipment during post weld heat treatment? Now, um, allowable stresses, there is, uh, as far as uh, I'm aware, so if there, there is no specific about the allowable stresses for post well heat treatment, but it depends on the problem that you are looking at. So if you are looking at a fracture problem uh, and you are concerned about the post well heat treatment uh, issues, then you get the stress field and then you have to look at either, I mean, generally there's no separate allowable for post well heat treatment. So if you, you have to look at your strength checks and all, as whatever the allowable is given for that situation. Okay, so I think, yeah, thank you. Looks like uh, there was a good amount of interest and I've got many questions from you guys. So thank you again for attending the webinar. And we'll, we'll also have other webinars. We'll, uh, we'll uh, let you guys know, we'll inform generally, we send out emails and also on our LinkedIn. So if you can follow our uh, company on the LinkedIn, you'll get all the updates. And we also go to many conferences such as the uh, pressure versus the piping conferences and others. So we'll, if you are interested, we can meet there and have a discussion with you. And we are always open to talk with you about any problems you want us to take a look at. I'll, I'll, I'm still waiting if there is some more questions comes in and then we'll conclude the webinar and we'll share the presentation file as well as the recording with all of you. And please feel free to share it inside your company or, uh, or even anyone you know who, who might have an interest in this topic. So I'll just uh, keep myself silent and wait for if there is any more questions out there. Uh, there's another question for your level three dent analysis. Do you typically always do a ratcheting analysis? How is this different than elastic plastic analysis? Okay. So for ratcheting analysis, yes, there is there is a criteria based on that you will probably have to perform ratcheting or not. So there is there is a filtering criteria, and then uh, the way it will be different is you have to use the kinematic hardening, and then you you run a couple of cycles and see if your basically the idea is if you see your displacement is increasing or it, it stabilizes. So depending depending on the filtering you can do the latching analysis. Okay. Uh, 
and and this is common for uh, for any kind of damage Yes, uh, we have done flow-induced vibration and heat exchanger. Uh, we actually recently worked on a problem uh, of, of that manner. Yeah, can you analyze helical heat exchanger uh, with the heat transfer analysis? I, I need to check that with our CFD expert, but I think uh, we can. Uh, let me let me see if I can find our CFD support today. Yeah, I'll have our CFD expert answer this question. And he has, um, his name is Moti, and he has, he has previously worked in CDR, of course, he has a lot of experience with the software as well as in general. Like his PhD was on CFD topics. So I'll have Moti answer this, the last question. Can you analyze helical heat exchanger heat transfer analysis through CFD? I, I think yeah, yeah, it's yeah. possible. Yeah. I just wanted Hi, to make sure. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, it is possible. But can you explain uh, 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 more on the like you know what uh, like what challenges are you seeing uh, to model using CFD? Maybe we can uh, we'll share our contact information so we can have an online chat uh, to understand what you are looking into. Okay, I think uh, we have okay one more question looks like. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think we will uh, probably conclude the webinar. And uh, again, thanks for attending and thanks for your time. I hope it was useful and I uh, will have a future conversation with all your needs. And if you if, feel free to ask us any questions, I mean, if you uh, if you have anything you are dealing with, we'll be more than happy to discuss. It's always always interesting to know uh, well, how how we can help each other and also like it, it, it gives us a very good uh, experience as well. So please feel free to contact us if you have any anything you want to discuss. Uh, and if you have any further question, I guess there's no more questions coming in. I'll double check one more time. Yeah. And then we'll uh, we'll stop the webinar here and we'll share the recording and the presentation. And please uh, follow us on, on LinkedIn if you uh, will we'll share that information as well. So then you will get all the updates about our webinars and our other activities. Uh, looking forward to meet you in the future. Thanks uh, again for attending the webinar. Thank you. Have a nice day.